Dear John, thank you for the very friendly words. Um, you hear that my voice is not absolutely fine, but I think I will make it easily um, through this lecture. I want to express my gratitude that I can deliver this lecture today, and I have been very grateful. Uh, I could visit several centers in the UK and could talk to a lot of colleagues as a visiting professor, and I was very much impressed by the research particularly of the young investigators. And therefore, I am convinced that uh, British endocrinology has a very bright future indeed. You know, the title of my talk is not really giving anything away, and it's easy uh, to start with such a, a title because you do not actually know what you're going to talk uh, when you do the lecture. But it became, uh, it, there was a twist in that title because um, actually exactly one year ago, I spent my time not at the bedside, but rather in bed of the ICU because an H1N1 virus made me suffer quite a lot. And now I'm back at my favorite uh, bench, my desk, but I'm hopefully not going back the other direction. <laughs> so, to set my agenda, I want to focus on three things. And the first is some recent advances in clinical decision-making after complete resection in adrenocortical carcinoma. And that affects actually the majority of patients. Our key question in Würzburg and other centers in Europe is, how can we improve important outcomes, that is disease-free survival, overall survival, quality of life in patients with ACC? So that is a headline above everything we do in the, in the field of adrenal tumors. And sometimes that it's very easy. Just by finding out the truth, and I give you this example, I was struck by the highly highly variable overall survival in completely resectable ACC. You see, some of those patients have a median survival of almost seven years and others of less than four years. And it is not that those papers here were the old ones and those papers the new ones, but you see the most recent paper is from 2007 is associated with the worst survival. So I thought the basis of this would be possibly a serious sampling bias. And that is very important. If I have today a patient with ACC, his nephew immediately goes to the internet and if he tells his uncle about that survival curve, the, this is very depressing for the patient. So we looked at our database, and, and what we did is that we said, well, we select only those patients where we do not know whether they get a recurrence or not, and where we are sure that they have not survived for a very long time, so that we know, we know that they did not have a recurrence. So we just only included patients within three months after surgery with no recurrence at that time. And you see, in this unfortunately still rather small group, the survival is dramatically different from the retrospective group. And the basis for this is a selection bias. Those patients being operated somewhere else and doing very well never show up in these centers. And some centers only sample patients after they get a recurrence. So I show my patients our curve, and that cheers them up a lot. <laughs> I must say that not all of those patients are recurrence-free. <clears throat> so it's 
interesting what affects recurrence-free and overall survival after complete resection. And I go to data from the German registry collected and analyzed by Felix Bräuschlein and Martin Fastnard. And you see in these um, totally resected patients, NSAID stage is not so important. You, between NSAID stage one, it's a tumor confined to the adrenal of less than five centimeter and NSAID stage two, a tumor confined to the adrenal but larger. There's actually no study showing a real difference. NSAID stage three indicates uh, growth into neighboring tissue or neighboring organs or uh, venous invasion. And there is some effect on recurrence-free survival and overall survival. But this is not so very impressing. And the question is, do we have any other predictors? <clears throat> and so we looked at the data comprehensively doing all histological markers available and also the ki 67 And you see in the German cohort, the effect of ki 67 is very profound indeed. Much stronger than NSAID stage, even after multivariate uh, correction. And you see this is a rather large sample. And now today we can have a validation sample another 250 patients from the European network showing exactly the same. And if you have a patient with a ki 67 below 10%, then the median recurrence-free survival here, I looked at it up, is in the region of 10 years. And that raises, of course, the question, do all these patients really need adjuvant treatment with mitotain? But importantly, it shows you that it is absolutely essential to have ki 67 analysis of the tumor. It is a, a mandatory part in the future. I show you another study from last year where we were participated. And again, I point out that it's a huge number of patients. All are nil resected. And looking at the relapse-free survival and overall survival in those having initially a cortisol-producing tumor or a non-cortisol-producing tumor. And you see those producing cortisol do less well. But what I wanted to show you is, in this large study, a number of patients, a high percentage, but not all, received mitotain. And you can see, again, that mitotain really reduces the recurrence rate. So the hazard ratio for recurrence is about 0.65. And it does not differ between cortisol secretion and non-cortisol hypersecretion. So this is another piece in the puzzle that mitotain is actually an important drug in adjuvant therapy. And finally, the last bit in the same direction, that in adjuvant, adjuvant treatment with mitotain is actually very important. Here, as a follow-up of our New England Journal paper, we addressed the question whether it is necessary to also reach mitotain target levels, which is above 40 milligram per liter, to reduce the risk of recurrence. And what you see is that it is actually very important. So those reaching the target levels do much better and have a much lower risk of recurrence. So this gives you not only a guidance what, how to deal with mitotain in an adjuvant setting, but it's also a proof or a further evidence, not a proof, unfortunately, that mitotain is doing the job as it, you here see a kind of a dose-response relationship. So what are my first conclusions? Prospective cohort studies are now needed to better appreciate the true uh, perspective of our patients. And I 
suspect that they will change the perceived prognosis in ACC. The KIA 67 index will become a mandatory part of the pathological workup as it is in neuroendocrine tumors. Also, the numbers might be slightly different, and they actually will be the basis for a tumor grading. And we have in the recent years collected further evidence that adjuvant mitotain improves disease free survival, but it is important to reach target drug levels. <clears throat> Treatment of ACC is very difficult. Mitotain is not a very pleasant drug to take, and we want to improve the situation getting better targets for treatment and getting better treatments. And of course, the way to go, we believe, perhaps we're wrong, is to analyze the molecular basis of adrenal tumorogenesis. <clears throat> and so we did some studies in that area, and we started with looking at copy number alterations using SNP arrays, and you see there's a huge difference between adenoma and carcinoma, and in carcinoma you have gains and losses all over the place with a remarkable growth amplification in chromosome 5. And this is confirmed in fish analysis, and if you do unsupervised genomic clustering, demonstration of complete amplification of or very large amplification of chromosome 5 clearly indicates that you deal with an adrenocortical carcinoma. But of course, we are more interested to find some essential mutations in adrenal tumorogenesis. And we thought it's easier to start with benign adenomas to find some initiating mutations. And so there are not that many copy number gains, and there are a lot of micro alterations, and then we looked at the data for recurrent changes, and this is a set of, of genes we found. One is CYP2W1, I come to that back later. Ephrine receptor family, notch signaling is very important, and we found there was a recurrent loss in serum glucocorticoid kinase 1. And we thought we just check if this leads to something, if we go deeper into this. And so we looked for expression of SGK1 in tumors, and the first thing we observed that not only those with losses, but in fact all cortisol-producing adenomas had very, very low levels of SGK1 expression and also those with subclinical disease. And similar findings were in ACC. And when we used our uh, tumor basis, our micro tissue microarrays, we could show together with the clinical data that expression of that gene is associated with survival, independent of its association with cortisol production. So you see those with very low expression have a clearly poorer survival. But does that lead us to new treatments? We couldn't see that. We looked at knockout animals. We didn't see an adrenal phenotype. And we thought we are not really at the heart of the matter. <clears throat> I was very impressed by that landmark paper on KCNG5 mutations in con adenomas. And what impressed me so much, that exome sequencing of just four adenomas did, led to the discovery of recurrent mutations. I thought, okay, that's the way to go. And we started exome sequencing in adrenal Cushing adenomas. We selected those with really active disease. And to our positively shocking surprise, we found in eight out of these 10 tumors, a somatic mutation in the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A. In seven, it was exactly the identical mutation. And it's the first time that a mutation in the catalytic subunit of, of uh, PKA has been 
connected with human disease. And it is in a highly conserved part, which is the same in Drosophila and in Homo sapiens. <laughs> so, we did a structural analysis and to find out what this leucine arginine mutation actually did. And you can see that instead of the rather small leucine, here is a rather large arginine sticking out, which might interact with a regulatory subunit. To, to demonstrate that I prepared myself for that talk, I now show you an ad a typical adrenal cell adrenocortical cell with its ACTH receptor. This ACTH receptor is activated by the uh, ligand, and when it's activated, the G proteins um, attach to it and get activated themselves. GTP is added, and then this complex <coughs> moves in the direction of adenylate cyclase, <coughs> I hope it goes on, yes. And then ATP is converted into cyclic AMP. And that then uh, goes to the protein kinase A consisting of two regulatory suppressing subunits and the catalytic subunit. By contact with the cyclic AMP, the catalytic subunit is released. It goes to the nucleus and it starts phosphorylating, and particularly it phosphorylated cyclic, cyclic AMP responsive element binding protein, and then that starts steroidogenesis. <coughs> and now, in our mutation, we of course hypothesized that the altered regulatory subunit cannot properly interact with the regulatory subunit and that it becomes continuously active. <clears throat> well, that is easy uh, to assume and everyone from you would, of you would also have assumed this, but it has to be shown. But it is a lot of difficult experiments to do. You have to transfect not only the catalytic subunit, but of course regulatory subunit and uh, Davide Calibiro from our Pharmacology Institute did this using FRET technology. And you see, using cyclic AMP analogs in the wild type, you get a nice stimulation of PKA activity, whereas if you use the mutant, it is active already in the absence of cyclic AMP. <laughs> so then we moved on and did uh, sequencing in additional 181 adrenal tumors, uh, adenomas, inactive adenomas, cortisol-producing adenomas, adrenocortical cancer, and we found that mutation only in Cushing adenomas and among the Cushing adenomas only in those with overt disease. And interestingly, of all those with overt disease without mutation, uh, at the same age and the same tumor size, they had lower cortisol uh, after dex than those with mutation and lower urinary free cortisol excretion than those with mutation. So it's, these are these very active uh, adrenocortical tumors. And this uh, study was complemented by data from Stratakis, Konstantin Startakis group in patients with bilateral adrenal hyperplasia and Cushing syndrome, not having the typical mutations, and there they found some patients with a duplication of the uh, catalytic subunit gene, as you can see here, and these tumors or these adrenals showed also increased activity of protein kinase A in comparison to control adrenals. So a lot of people did this very nice work. Uh, Felix Beuschlein, Martin Fasnard, Davide Kalebirov uh, did the functional studies, 
and we work together with people from Paris here, Guillaume Assy. So, for the first time, a large portion of adrenal Cushing syndrome is completely understood on a molecular level, or almost completely understood on the molecular level, 36%. And this is extremely suggestive that this mutation is really the culprit for that disorder. But importantly, and in some expect, unfortunately, it is not present in subclinical Cushing syndrome or ACC. So our ACC aim, we did not come very much nearer. And we, it is, of course, a good idea to think that this mutation might also play a role in the other endocrine and non-endocrine tumors. And there has been a paper in Science very recently demonstrating, in fact, that this is the case. <laughs> so it's a very nice result. We are very pleased by this, but it is not practice changing. So the question is, what is if you go to ACC genomics? And the NSAT group has put together really a comprehensive anal analysis from different angles, which I'm not going to show to you because it's still embargoed and it's a major part, a really major part of the work is from Jerome Terras group and it will be out within the next three weeks. I just show you that the key pathways found are the beta-catenin pathway, the P53 signaling, and chromatin remodeling. And that has been known before. So in some way, these results are somewhat disappointing because I was hoping for some immediate target for our future treatment strategies. <clears throat> so for the, in the near future, I suppose that we don't get good genomic targets. So what about non-genomic target strategies? <clears throat> and of course, one example is again mitotain. This is a non-genomic therapy for ACC. It also hits the normal adrenocortical cells. Unfortunately, the mechanism is still unknown. <clears throat> and the other I come to in the second part is now the final part of my talk. Of course, mitotain alters gene expression in ACC cells, and Matthias Kreuz from our group looked at this in more detail. And when we look at the genes which light up, then we have some genes which are very much stimulated and others which, where the expression is very much suppressed. For instance, ATP binding cassette subfamily G1 is strongly suppressed. When we confirm this with real-time PCR, we see that it's confirmed and we see a very, very strong impression of these four genes, expression and, this, uh, and the reduced expression here for ABCG1. These genes are all involved in endoplasmic reticulum stress. And these genes are involved in lipid metabolism, ABCG1, has an important role in cortisol ex exporting from cells. <clears throat> and if ER stress goes, becomes too strong, ER stress is basically a defense or triggers a defense mechanism, but if it's too much, the cells will die. <clears throat> and we were struck by this suppression of uh, the, the lipid genes and we looked for cholesterol accumulation. And intriguingly, we found that by giving mitotain, we get a very strong accumulation of cholesterol in adrenocortical cancer cell line that was not present in other cell lines. So that seems to be a rather specific effect of mitotain on the adrenal. <clears throat> The central gene in the unfolded protein response in response to ER stress is CHOP. And if that is 
if, if that effect becomes too strong, you see all these ER pathways converge onto this uh, common uh, member of, of these uh, metabolic uh, signaling structure, then that leads eventually to cell death. So we could possibly use mitotain-induced ER stress as an important part of mitotain action, and we could possibly enhance this with additional treatments. And you can see here a classical ER stress inducer, and here you see the CHOP expression, then the mitotain increased uh, CHOP expression is largely enhanced by an additional stress inducer. <clears throat> so the last short aspect goes to CYP2W1. Why does it interest us? It is an often cytochrome enzyme because the physiological ligand is unknown. What is very important and has stimulated me a lot is that it is able to bioactivate procarcinogens into potent drugs, into cytotoxic drugs. <coughs> and CYP2W1 has been said to be selectively expressed in malignant tumors or during fetal life. But some data showed that it's not only expressed in some forms of colonic cancer, but also in some tumors of the adrenal gland. <coughs> in fact, there are already compounds which you can use which are activated by that enzyme into very potent tumor toxins, which are very interesting because they will also cause a kind of a bystander effect. And this has studied in colon cancer cells transfected with CYP2W1, and you see that those cells transfected stop growing if they are treated with that compound, whereas those not transfected do not stop growing, and those treated with uh, this vehicle are also not affected at all. So this would allow us a targeted chemotherapy. <clears throat> and therefore, we were very happy to see that, we, that a lot of tumors and carcinomas, but also adenomas, and to our surprise, also adrenal adenomas, had a high expression of this enzyme, which seems to be rather specific for the adrenal, and as we have seen, is associated also to some extent with hormone secretion. You see, the normal tissues do not express this. Non-adrenal normal tissues. <laughs> And intriguingly, the expression is somehow related to the response to mitotain. So it might be that mitotain is a substrate for CYP2W1, or at least CYP2W1 is one of the enzymes which could possibly activate mitotain. And you see those having high expression of that enzyme have a, a longer remission than those having very low expression of that. And this works also in advanced disease where we have more stable disease and partial responses in those having high expression of CYP2W1. <laughs> so genomic alterations in ACC currently offer very limited targeted treatment options. Non-genomic treatment with mitotain is, as I have hoped to have shown you, of major clinical relevance we do not know exactly how mitotain works, but we know now that mitotain induces profound ER stress and probably via lipid accumulation. And we could possibly take advantage and enhance the mitotain induced ER stress to increase its clinical efficacy. And CYP2W1 may become a strategy for a valuable non genomic treatment target in ACC. So this is my final slide. I thank you for your attention. A lot of people work together in the endocrine <coughs> network for the study of adrenal tumors, NSAT, for my group to name Martin Fasnacht, Christina Ronki, Silvius Piera, Matthias Kreuz, and Stefanie Hanna. Of course, the people from UNIC, Felix Beuschel and Martin Reinke, 
da wie der Calibiro von Martin Loses Group at the Pharmacology Institute, Konstantin Stratakis, the very, very strong Paris Group, Jerome Berterat has done a marvelous job these days with three New England Journal papers and one uh, Nature Genetics paper and the exome sequencing people uh, from the Helmholtz Centrum in Munich. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>